So over the last several weeks, we have been looking at the Four Noble Truths as taught by the Buddha. And in our, in our short session this evening, we'll just do a little recap. But I have to say to recap the Four Noble Truths and anything short of a week's retreat for each is, um, shall we say, cutting some corners. But we'll, we'll do that, we'll understand, and perhaps we'll just get a little sense. And, and then on uh, our longer sessions, we can fill in. So immediately after his awakening, the first teaching that the Buddha offered, which is called the initial turning of the wheel of Dharma, he said, I have discovered the middle way, meaning that he would not pursue a life of extreme luxury nor a life of extreme austerity because he found that neither one really worked. And then he offered the teaching that has become known as the Four Noble Truths. Forty-five years later, just before his death, he said, all I have ever taught was the essence of these four truths, that there is suffering and there is an end of suffering. Suffering in Pali is called Dukkha. Since I always uh, find myself uncomfortable translating dukkha, I sometimes just resort to saying dukkha, but it means suffering or stress or unsatisfactoriness, unrest, from the major suffering to the minor unrest that we experience. So the first noble truth as described by the Buddha was the truth of suffering. There is suffering. And as I always add here, he did not say life is about suffering. He didn't say that we should suffer. He did not say that at all. He said, I have seen the truth of suffering. And the second noble truth, he said, I have seen the truth of the cause of suffering. And that, uh, that cause he identified as craving grasping, that endless desire. We're familiar with that, certainly in our society. Our society encourages us to crave and desire and to grasp. But once we see that truth, that the cause is craving, we can also see the third noble truth, which is the noble truth of cessation, of the end of suffering. When we see how we cause ourselves suffering, it is logical then to say, ah, I can end suffering by stopping creating how I create suffering. Of course, this has to go through a human being, and human beings are subject to habit energy, conditioning, reactive responses that we've been practicing essentially all our lives. So to break our patterns, to change what our society is essentially encouraging, is a lifetime of work, and perhaps more than one lifetime of work. But the very effort itself can show us remarkable joy and remarkable ease and remarkable awakening. And that brings us to the fourth noble truth, which is the noble truth of the way out of suffering. The path, which is known as the noble eightfold path, because there are eight steps or eight facets. There's an essential difference between the first three truths and the fourth noble truth. The first three truths need to be studied, to be understood. In the words of the texts, they need to be penetrated, to be realized, so that ultimately one says, these truths have been realized. The difference then in the fourth noble truth, the path, 
is that this is what we do. This can be started without an understanding, although understanding the path really helps. But this is about what we do, how to lead life. So those eight steps, and I'm going to first introduce a word, the word in Pali is samma, S-A-M-M-A, and we translate that either as right or skillful. Those are the two translations you'll see most often. Right, not meaning right as opposed to wrong, but right meaning, take the first step, for instance, right view. There is a way to view a situation that can lead to the end of suffering. That is considered right view. To view a situation or a thought or any phenomena in a way that perpetuate suffering or create suffering for oneself or others is considered to not be a right view. So using the word right, the eight steps would be right view, right thinking, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. These eight facets are put into three categories, which just help us to understand the logic of the path. The three categories are, they start with pana in, in Pali or prajna in Sanskrit, which is wisdom. The two facets of wisdom are right view and right thinking. They lead to the three facets called sila, or morality. Right speech, right action, right livelihood. And then the three facets of samadhi, which is either concentration or discipline. I tend to say discipline because one of the three steps in this category is actually right concentration. It's right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Now, although this is called a path, that can be a bit misleading. This is not a path that goes from point A to point B. You don't start at the beginning of the path because there isn't a beginning of the path. So think of it almost as circular, and any of us at any time step in any place on this circular path, we step in where is needed, where is appropriate, where our thoughts or our views or our speech or our action can lead to the end of suffering for ourselves and for others. Now, of course, we have to name these steps, so there is a traditional order, although there are those who, who break that tradition. But traditionally, we start with right view. And interestingly, we end with right view. But we kind of start with right view at what is likely to be a kind of rudimentary level. And then in our life journey, going deeper and deeper and deeper, we find our ability to view things as they really are, to have become deeper with more clarity. So we start with right view, but it's right view that is becoming deeper and deeper with practice. <laughs> right view is the ability to see things as they really are, which Buddhists say is the ground of wisdom. To see things as they really are. When we don't see things as they really are, the Buddhists will say that is delusion. And the three poisons that we deal with in this life form are greed, hatred, and delusion. Delusion is kind of the nice word for ignorance because you know, we say ignorant that it was, I'm not ignorant. But occasionally I can be deluded, so I'm willing to accept that. So to not see things as they really are is really a state of delusion. 
So our efforts are to see things as they really are. That is right view. What gets in the way is our ongoing habit energy to immediately add to what it is that the actual experience is. Our write-ons, our concerns. If I twist my ankle outside, there's pain. That's it. Now, what gets added to that is, oh, the pain is awful. Okay, so awful that I'm not going to be able to get to work today. And if I don't get to work today, I think I'm one day over my vacation days, I can get fired or I'm certainly going to be reprimanded. And that's why I got fired from my last job. Now I'll be fired again from another job, fired from two jobs. I'll never get enough. My kids are going to starve, not to mention they'll never go to work. This is the biography. We love writing our biographies. Why not? It's about me. What's more interesting to me than me? So I get caught up in that. Whether it's a pleasant biography or an unpleasant biography hardly matters, as long as it's about me. So that's the pull. And that is a form of craving that makes me the center of the universe. Now, if you tell me that I'm not the center of the universe, I will say that's not true, and I will think that. And why would you tell me that I'm not the center of the universe? Because you are. And if I tell you that you're not, you will cling to that. And that's why we're in conflict. I mean, there has to be some reason why, after how many millions of years, we still think the way to do it is to kill each other, and then that will solve everything and we'll be at peace. We haven't caught on yet that doesn't work, but maybe we will someday. So, right view, to see things as they really are, with clarity, with ease, with simplicity. That lays the ground for right thinking. The way I view something will become the way I think about it. And the way my thinking will then move into the way I speak, the actions that I take. And the Buddhists saw that we spend an enormous amount of time involved in the way we earn our livelihood. And so, right livelihood is actually a step in this path. So that progression to see things as they really are leads to clear thinking. And clear thinking will bring about compassion, which will balance with wisdom. And then we've got a pretty decent life going. That balance of compassion and wisdom. So that is just a bare touch of the Noble Eightfold Path but I encourage reading about this, and of course we'll be doing more in our longer sessions. It is the heart and soul of what the Buddha taught. There is so much commentary and so many, 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 many discourses, but this is it. The Buddha said it himself. This is all that I have taught, that there is suffering and there is an end to suffering. And that is just filled with faith and hope and joy. So take it, hold it, enjoy it, and let's sit with that for just a minute or two and let that, let that sink in.